So what I want to talk about today is developing world problems, not problems of the developed world. So I'm going to start with a question. The question is, where in the world do you think most of the disease burden lies? And then I'm going to follow that with a second question. Where in the world do you think most of the health research dollars are spent? Do those two things match up? Well, the obvious answer to the first question, where is the greatest burden of disease, is sub-Saharan Africa. There are over a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa that suffer from a variety of chronic, lifelong, debilitating, life-threatening diseases. Highest infant mortality rates, shortest life expectancies in the world. But if you look at where the health dollars go, and in particular where the research is being done to cure disease, it's all in the developed world and overwhelmingly on diseases of the developed world. So it's not even as though here in the developed world we're doing research that's going to benefit these people. We're not even doing things that might help them in the future. We're doing things in our laboratories that help us. So I'm going to try to illustrate that this need not necessarily be the case with one of the few shining examples of a success story where developed world solutions have been applied in the developing world with astounding results. And so what I'm going to talk about is a disease called onchocerciasis, or a little easier to say perhaps, river blindness. Now this disease is one of what the World Health Organization are calling the neglected tropical diseases. There are about a dozen or so of these diseases that are recognized by the World Health Organization and other organizations around the world as being the major causes of both mortality or death, but more importantly, morbidity or a reduction in the quality and quantity of people's lives. So river blindness is the disease I've chosen because it is extremely severe in its consequences for the people that suffer from it. And it is a disease where there has been a solution working its way through sub-Saharan Africa for the last 25 years or so that has had astonishing success, but is essentially unknown outside of sub-Saharan Africa and a small community of tropical disease research uh, people in the developed world. So what is it that river blindness does? Well, this illustration here used to be a very common sight in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, especially in West Africa. A small child leading a man holding onto a stick. The reason the child is leading the man is because the man is blind. And so as the name suggests, the most important effect of river blindness or onchocerciasis is that you will go blind. It is the second leading cause of infectious blindness in the world. But unfortunately, the problems associated with the disease don't stop there. Not everybody who gets infected with the uh, little worm that causes this disease will go blind. But virtually everybody who is infected develops a very severe skin disease that is both um, debilitating and also extremely irritating. So you will spend virtually your entire life with a chronic severe dermatitis that leads eventually to loss of pigment in the skin and to thickening and scarring of the skin so that in, in this man here who's in his uh, 30s, the skin on his legs has become very thick and inelastic and deeply scarred and will eventually um, lose its pigmentation. So it looks terrible, it feels terrible, and eventually, in maybe 5% uh, or so of cases, it will culminate in severe visual impairment or blindness. What's the cause of all of this? Well, the cause of all of this is a worm 
that is transmitted by a fly that bites you. And those worms live in lumps like this, about the size of a golf ball, under the skin. They produce literally millions of baby worms, tiny little baby worms that crawl around in your skin for the rest of your life. These guys, the adults living in here, live for maybe 15 or 20 years. So you get infected as a child, so this is a picture of a child, and you remain infected for most of your life. And there is no treatment. There is no drug that will kill this worm here. So the situation looked pretty grim and um, there were large parts of Africa near rivers, so the parts of, of the land where people would really like to live, where they could not live because of this disease. So what's been done to alleviate this? What's the success story that I wanted to share with you? Well, the success story is uh, illustrated in these countries in blue and uh, more recently in the countries in green and especially the countries in yellow, which is where most of the disease occurs, here in Africa with a little bit in America. And in the blue countries in particular and the yellow countries, we're on the verge of, well, perhaps not eradication, but certainly control of this disease. Whereas in the rest of Africa in green, the situation's not quite so good, but the signs are promising. So we're talking about 37 million people who are infected, perhaps about 120 million or so that are at risk. Nearly all of them are in Africa, but in this part of Africa in particular, the western part of sub-Saharan Africa, the situation's pretty good at the moment. This just illustrates again that what we're talking about is largely an African problem, the poorest part of the world. So why do I say that the situation is really not that bad? In 1977, each of these black dots represented a community where more than 60% of the population in those communities was infected and developing these uh, symptoms that I showed you, the skin disease and eventually the blindness. So just to orient you here, this is Ghana, here is uh, Mali, Burkina Faso. So this is West Africa, south of the Sahara Desert. That was the situation in 1977. Virtually the whole of West Africa, the majority of people were ill with this disease. This is the situation after 25 years of control by the World Health Organization in this part of Africa. You can see now that there's almost no black dots and the only country actually where there are black dots is um, Sierra Leone where there was so much um, civil unrest, basically civil war, um, for most of that period that it was not possible to operate the control campaign. This control campaign has prevented 40 million people from becoming infected with this disease. It's present, prevented more than half a million cases of blindness over the last 25 or 30 years, mobilised 120,000 communities throughout the region, and from an economic perspective, it's yielded an additional million years of productive labour. So the economic problems of much of this part of Africa are caused by disease, as much as they are a cause of the disease. So these diseases of poverty are a contributing factor to the poverty. You take away river blindness and you're talking about putting a million years of productive labour back into those economies that was previously lost to this illness. So you get a 20% rate of return for every dollar that was spent. Now, if I could put my money in the bank and get 20% rate of return guaranteed over 30 years, I think I'd be doing that. So why aren't we doing this in these countries? Why aren't we putting our dollar into these countries to give those countries that 20% rate of return? And the other benefit here is that in the course of this campaign, three quarters of a million of health workers have been trained in rudimentary delivery of simple health care in these communities. So the knock-on effect goes way beyond river blindness itself. And just to put some numbers on this, you can see that everything's trending down. 
rates of infection are coming down, the rate of blindness is coming down, the rate of visual impairment is coming down, and the rate of skin disease is coming down as well. But these numbers are not yet down to zero. So what we're talking about is a campaign that has already run for 25 years, but needs to keep going for at least another 10 or 15, so that these trends can come all the way down to where we want them to be. How has this worked? Why has this been possible? Out of all of the neglected diseases, why is this the success story? Well, I think there are two really simple factors that have been at play here. The first is, there was the right man in the right place. And I don't mean to say that this is all down to one person, but one person has had a huge influence on this. Jimmy Carter, ex-president of the United States, took on river blindness as one of his personal crusades after he left office. He established the Carter Centre and he educated and lobbied and was really responsible for galvanising decision makers to put money into this problem. And then one of the large pharmaceutical companies in the US, Merck and Co, donated the one and only drug that actually helps with this disease. And they continue to donate that drug after 25 years. So you had somebody who knew which doors to knock on, knocking very loudly on those doors, and there was a tool that the company responsible for gave away for nothing. And then the World Health Organization put those two things together and you got a control campaign. So the equation is a really simple one. Political will meets an existing tool, the drug, Jimmy Carter. The result, money flows and you get a solution. And I think you will agree that the numbers that I've quoted in terms of the numbers of people that have been, whose lives have been improved and the economic benefits to those communities in sub-Saharan Africa have been enormous. So why talk about river blindness now? Is it all over? Well, unfortunately, as I pointed out, it's not all over yet. We still need to keep going with this disease. And so one of the things that um, I do in my real life as a, a research scientist here at La Trobe University is that I am in, involved in a research program that aims to make that drug more sustainable, to keep it going for longer and longer because it's the only drug we've got. There's little prospect of new drugs being developed. Nobody's going to develop a new drug and then just give it away. So we have to take the tools that were already out there and make them last for as long as possible. That's what the urgent call for research is all about now. How to make these early gains so hard fought for over the last 20 years sustainable. So what can you do? What, what's the point of talking about this? Not everyone's Jimmy Carter, obviously. Bill Gates has picked up malaria as his personal crusade and is in the process of doing for malaria what Jimmy Carter and his colleagues had done for river blindness during the 1970s and 1980s. And so malaria is going to go the same way, we all hope, as river blindness has gone, largely because of the activity of one person, Bill Gates. So I'm not a Bill Gates, I'm not a Jimmy Carter, I'm just an average academic at a university in Australia. But what can people like us do to make this problem better? Well, the obvious thing you can do is donate to a non-government organisation. And there are plenty of them that are active in sub-Saharan Africa. So if you do nothing else, the next time somebody knocks on your door, pull out your checkbook. But what I think is more effective, even if you're not Jimmy Carter or Bill Gates, is you try to educate people. You lobby your local politicians. You lobby the federal government. Australia spends a tiny fraction 
of its total health spending on diseases that occur outside of this country. In the last three years, the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia gave 15 grants for malaria research and nothing at all for any other neglected tropical disease. And finally, you volunteer. You give your time. The next time you take a holiday, don't go to Disneyland. Go to Africa. Help someone build a village. Help someone make an orphanage work better. Cost you about the same amount of money and the memories, I suspect, will be with you for an awful lot longer than the memories of Disneyland. Thank you. Thank you.